I have to say that I'm, I'm, you know, after six, seven years, and like even when we had the glory years, I think sometimes God, he thought, wow, that's so amazing, the glory was there, but they were tough years too, because we've been resisted from beginning to end, but the glory was there, so they've been tough years. And after a while, if you're like me, you don't allow yourself to go there anymore. Because, you know, you're hoping, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so you, you train yourself in contentment and being grateful for what you've been given and just not to go there. But I, would have, I have to say I'm going there now again. So something just, okay, it's a new season, have it another go. Even Abraham needed, repeat, you know, the word had to come again for him to start believing again. I want to say a quick word to the new people among us here, because I see a few new faces here this morning, and I want to talk generally about church. If we have, when we have a move of God coming here, we've got to be church properly, which means we've got to be one heart, one soul. We've got to be knitted together. We've got to be family. We've got to have a relationship that can handle some strain because we'll be really busy. This is a different season of church now. We will have a job to do. And anyone that's been in revival, they're super tired because you have so many people needy that are coming. They need to be prayed for. Like we got to, Our relationships got to hold. So it can't be consumer Christianity at that time. It's just not going to work. So there's a call for us to renew that. Probably half the church here, I think that's about roughly right, they've been in the church longer than five years, some 20, and then maybe other half is newer, and then some come and go. But I reckon once, once an outpouring comes, we've got to be church in order to do the job. But then I'm a little bit excited because... What we want, none of us has experienced. And I remember, uh, is it John Kilpatrick? He was the guy in Brownsville. They had it for a number of years. They had millions of people come to that church. He says, when the glory of God comes in the beginning, you think there's, you cannot handle anymore. There's so much of God's presence. You think it's just like, ah, this is the maximum what I can tolerate. And then it's, ah, but you're just getting your sea legs. Like, you know, once you get used to it, you will be able to handle more and it's just going to increase. And like, wouldn't that be amazing if we experience that here? Hey. Okay, with that kind of an introduction, <laughs> I go right back to the beginning of what it's all about. And that is about faith. Um, Kenneth Hagen, when he was 15 years old, um, he was lying in bed, grandmother and mother and youngest brother was around him, and he died. And when he died, he didn't go up, he went down. And he went down, down, down. It was pitch black, pitch black. He went, to, I think, sort of the center of the earth somewhere. It was, he just knew it was, was down. And that he couldn't see, it was pitch black. But suddenly he was at the entrance of a cave, and... And there were flames inside and fire inside, and he felt the heat. And um, it was basically the entrance of hell. Um, people ask him, can you describe to me what the entrance of hell looks like? And he says, there are no words for it. He just can't find words, but there are flames. It's where the damned are. And, you know, he, and he's right at the entrance of it, and he sees everything flickering and the heat, and he hesitates to go in. And then he notices there's a creature beside him that uh, actually grabs him and just wants to push him over the threshold. And so it's a bit, you know, he's panicking a little bit. And suddenly from above there is a mighty voice that speaks in a language that he doesn't know. And he doesn't know whether it's God or a mighty angel or something. But when that voice speaks with authority, everything in the nether region shakes and the creature lets him go and he goes up again. And then his spirit is actually returning to his body. Okay, so then he, um, his grandma had a medical background. He says, look, you were gone. You were dead. Eyes were open, unseeing, no pulse, no heartbeat. 
and she's been around dead people before. Happened the second time. And this, again, his spirit leaves the body, goes down, ends up at the entrance of hell. That voice speaks again, and he, he goes up. And then he dies a third time, and this time he knows he's not going to come back. Like, this is it. If he goes over that, that thre threshold, he, he's lost forever, for eternity. He's in hell. And, and so he's there, and he, um, in that experience, he cries out, God, God, I belong to the church, and I've been baptized in water. So that doesn't stop the descent. He still goes down, and then he cries out a second time, God, God, I belong to the church, and I'm baptized in water. And he still goes down. And then the third time, it's so no noisy that you know, no one ever wants him to demonstrate. He cries out as hard as he can, God, God, I belong to the church, and I've been baptized in water. And yet he goes down, but again, third time, the voice speaks, and He's let go and he goes up and in his body again. And while he goes up, he prays to Jesus, Jesus, um, please forgive me for my sins. I belong to you, Jesus. I look to you. So he prays in the spirit. And as soon as the spirit enters his body, it comes out of his mouth as well. His, his body prays. He says the experience was that his mom was outside praying aloud, top of her voice outside on the porch. It was in the 30s. I mean, there were not that many cars, but there were cars lined up all across the house. Uh, uh, for two blocks, they lined up in both directions because she was praying so loud for her son. And, and then everything changed, and he knew he was saved. And he was no longer afraid to die. So the question is, why did he go down? What, you know, like, he went to church... Um, he was baptized, and he didn't disagree with anything. Like, he had faith. Like, he was surprised that he went down. Like, how can that be? If you go to church, you're baptized in water, you're sitting there, you're agreeing with everything. How come that, what's wrong with that kind of faith? What kind of faith did he have that didn't quite work when it mattered? Okay, we, I, I unpack that slowly. I want to give you a few scriptures that actually remind us and confirm to us that everything that we receive from God, we receive by faith. Everything. It's the biggest key to everything. John chapter 3, whoever believes in him, Jesus Christ, may have eternal life. Romans chapter 3, the righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believe, all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus to be received by faith. Um, to a father, they wanted healing for his son. Jesus said, all things are possible for the one who believes, who has faith. Romans chapter 5, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. Because of our faith. Galatians chapter 3, we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So dozens and dozens and dozens of scripture passages, they all say the same thing. We receive by faith. But then what is faith? How would you define it? Because Ken Fagan, he would have defined it uh, in a way that didn't work. But what is faith? How do you define it? Trust, yes, yeah, that's, that's probably getting there. Um, one guy um, defined it as believing God. Is that a good definition? Another pastor thought that's the best definition, but I'm still confused. How would you define faith? And probably, um, rather than maybe a super precise definition, it's a little bit, what is faith not? Faith is not believing things about God. That's not enough. And I think uh, that is the big key. Faith in the sense of agreeing with the truth about Jesus Christ and God is not enough. 
And this is where the church throughout its entire history has gone wrong again and again and again and again because when, and you know, like when I was growing up and for many years, I went wrong as well. I had a wrong understanding of faith. Um, you know, you read John Wesley, for instance, and he says, the intellectual assent to the truth of the Bible is not enough. That's not faith. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he got stuck into my good old countrymen. And he talked about cheap grace and he said, um, cheap grace, an understanding of God's goodness which understands faith mainly as the mind agreeing with a doctrine, a principle, a system amounts to the total denial of God's word. I mean, this is, this is the church I've grown up in, that, that basically you think that if you believe and you think it's correct, the doctrine that you're justified by faith through grace, if you can say that, and if you say that you believe it, then automatically you're saved. And that's wrong. So that's John Wesley, that's Bonhoeffer, you can go to Luther, you, you can go throughout entire church history. People in the church knew it for a while, and then you just wait long enough, that sort of knowledge actually disappears. And then people are just sitting there, and they think they have faith, and they think they're right with God, and they go to church, and they're baptized in water, but they're not saved, and they don't even know what's missing. I think um, E. Stanley Jones um, lived last century and uh, you know traveled. The, his estimate was that two thirds of people sitting in church are not born again; they're not saved. Well, two thirds is that's a lot, but um, Charles Finney is another guy that, that's been preaching it. He, in his personal experience, he would say he come across. Thousands upon thousands of people in church that had a wrong understanding of faith and therefore were not saved. Are you agreeing with this? Or is it a bit outrageous? No, it, it's totally true. Um, some people, you know, my wife, Tatiana, got COVID at home. When she was 16, she joined our youth group, and after a while, I mean, she, she thought she was an atheist, but after a while, she wanted to become a Christian, because it looked to her like the Christians had something that she wanted. And then, you know, the other members of the youth group asked her, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Do you believe that he died for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. Do you, um, do you believe that he can give you eternal life? Yes. And so they asked all the catalog of questions, and Tatiana said yes to all the questions, and then they said, you are a Christian. And I wasn't part of the conversation, but I would have exact, said exactly the same. You are a Christian. Snap out of it. And if you don't feel like one, it's by faith. <laughs> As if faith is against any experience. And Tatiana had the sense that, no, she was right, she wasn't. And she went to the preacher um, at the time, and you know, he asked her, you know, is there a, a, a sin that you haven't confessed? You know, something that still separates you from God? There wasn't. And then he just had a simple prayer for you know, faith and for the Holy Spirit to come upon her. And it was just a simple prayer, and then Tatiana from one second to the next knew that she was saved and that she was a Christian and had no doubt about it and started giggling for the rest of the day. So before that, she ticked all the intellectual boxes. She agreed with everything, but it wasn't saving faith. Charles Finney, when it was his turn, he argued till the cows come home, insisting that he was already a Christian because he believed everything and all the doctrines were taught and he was taught in depth and he believed them all. And he said, only um, at the time of my conversion did I see my error. I wasn't saved. People, and, and maybe I, I quote him, maybe gives you a bit of an idea. 
They read and perhaps search the scriptures to learn their duty and to learn about Christ. They intellectually believe all that they understand the scriptures to say about him. But when Christ is thus commended to their confidence, they do not by an act of personal commitment to him so join their souls to him as to receive from him the influx of his life and light and love. So what's... I don't know, that's his words. But what's the difference between intellectually believing the truth and having saving faith? Childlikeness, yes. Relationship, yes. Yes, personal commitment. I think this is what he's trying to say with believing God. So it's not just believing things about God, but it's believing God and He speaks to you. I offer eternal life for you. Will you give me your life? And it becomes this personal relationship where you personally say yes to Jesus. And you confess your sins to God. It's not just a theory. You're dealing with a person and you commit yourself to that person and to follow that person. And then what happens? Yeah, the Holy Spirit gives you new life. You're born again. You're birthed of the Spirit of God. Become a new person. And that is an experience. Because you get filled with the peace of God and the joy of God. The joy of salvation. And it doesn't have to be you know, super noisy and ecstatic. It, 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 your heart can be quietly warmed. Like, wasn't that John Wesley like that? Um, but yeah, then you receive by faith. And you know, for years in the ministry, I never paid attention to what happened to people that gave their heart to Jesus. Like you would have an altar call, they would be there, they would repeat the prayer. But do they automatically become Christians, all of them? No. Like it's, it's not difficult, but like if they're just there intellectually agreeing with something or if they're there just because it sounded like a good idea, like... You've got to pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is actually doing in the individual. Okay, it, it looks like we're agreeing. Then I go to the next one. So you have faith, and according to the Bible, we are saved by faith. And then the Bible insists very much that it's not by works. I'll read to you, maybe for instance, Ephesians chapter 2, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. A person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. He saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And the Bible is super insistent that salvation is given to us by faith through grace. We're not doing anything towards it. And so we can't brag about anything towards it. It's undiluted, purely a gift from God. Right? We agree with that. That's the Bible teaching. But then it gets complicated because then the Bible also says, yeah, yeah, everything is by faith, but if your faith has no works, it's dead. Right? Which is a little bit... So how does it hang together? Like, um, on, on the one hand, it's just by faith, but... If there are no, no works with faith, then somehow your faith is dead and you're in trouble anyway because you have no works. So like, ah, oh, it's so nice to hear it's all by faith, then I don't have to worry. But then, well, if you haven't got any works, you've got to worry after all. So how does that hang together? And then, you know, um, uh, uh, my tradition, like, maybe your tradition, then they talk about that, oh, faith, you know, uh, good works automatically flow out of faith. What? Like, faith is so amazed about Jesus that, you know, works just follow from that. I think that's shorthand for something that by itself doesn't make sense. Because, you know, the way I've always understood it and the people around me that understood it, they said, look, Intellectually, you believe Jesus died for the forgiveness of your sins. He suffered so much pain so you could be free. 
And because I intellectually understand this doctrine so amazingly, my heart automatically overflows with gratitude, and therefore I want to do all those things that are good works. It's not working. There's something missing. What's missing? You look at me quizzically, Penny. You concentrate. Yeah, you concentrate. Yes, so, so we get to that because I, I'm doctrinally, intellectually convinced about a lot of things. Like, you know, let's say um, I used to smoke years ago until Tatiana said no. <laughs> <laughs> so intellectually, I was very convinced that it's not good for your health, right? But that didn't really automatically flow into great, brilliant behavior. And, and you're convinced of many things intellectually, and you still do the things that... He, right. So, like, don't talk to me that, yeah, you, have, you know everything about Jesus, and then because you feel so... I don't know. It, it doesn't work like that. And uh, the, the language that good works automatically flow from faith is lacking, it's shorthand for something that actually explains how it works. So with faith comes what? No, yeah, yeah, that's faith as well. Like This is really the key to understand the Christian life. We're saved by faith through grace. By faith. Be, because by faith comes what? Let's be charismatic for a moment. The Holy Spirit. Uh, really, you cannot understand the Christian life or anything about God unless you actually allow that in your mind. By faith comes the Holy Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, we actually live the Christian life out of the power of the Spirit. Amen. And only in this way is it grace. Because we don't live in our own power, we live in God's power. It's... It, and, we get directed by him, guided by him. Um, we do warfare with him. The, the power that overcomes our own flesh and sin is by the Spirit of God. And if it was in any other way, it would be in our own strength. And so this is, you know, let's say, um, i give you a quote from Luther. How about that? So faith is a divine work in us. Oh, it's a living, energetic, energetic, active, mighty thing, this faith. It cannot but do good unceasingly. There's no question asked whether good works are to be done. But before the question is asked, the works have been done, and there's a continuous doing of them. But any person not doing such works is without faith. You know, this is confusing until he actually says, the Holy Spirit is doing this in the believer. So when the Spirit of God comes on you and you, you become alive in God, you become a new person. You have new desires, new passions. You're hungry for God. You, Connor shared that in their youth group uh, Friday a week ago, there was one guy that was always distant from everyone else. You know, throws a tantrum and just keeps by himself, computer games and everything. And then he got saved that night. And he, he got filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he grabbed the microphone, was among with everyone else, and says, I love you, I love you, I, you are amazing. <laughs> That's the Spirit of God. No one made him, but the Spirit of God just gave a new heart of compassion and excitement. True, Connor? I, I said that correctly? Yes, so um, I, I read it from Scriptures. When Titus chapter 3, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior, that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. If, uh, this is 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ that is grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, He's a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. 
and there are more scriptures like that. I skip all of that because I said I keep it short. But I have one more point. So faith is believing God. It's personal. Uh, it's trust. It's believing God for yourself. And as, as you exercise faith, you're receiving the Holy Spirit. And as you receive the Holy Spirit, then good works come out of that because the Holy Spirit gives you the desire and power to do God's will. Okay, so faith, we, we probably get a bit of a better handle on it now, but is it easy or is it hard? Faith. Easy or hard? Like, you know, on the one hand you think, at least it's not works. Works could be hard, but faith is hard too. Would you agree? It's, it's quite hard. So what's, so what's so tough about it? Sorry? It's the initial step. Ah, uh, yeah, yes, the initial step. I think it's every day. Yeah, it's the everyday step. Yeah. Well, we have all different answers, but at least we're agreeing on it. It's difficult. And the difficult thing is, we're preaching right now a Jesus that loves you more than you can ever imagine. That got the fullness of life for you, that got joy, that conquered Satan for you, that promises you eternal life, that is amazing for you. And you know, you have you, God is so much on your side. That's what you hear, and that's what you put your faith in, and then reality hits. And what is reality? It, 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 there are trials. It's, it's like stuff happens in life and sickness comes and soccer injuries come and like um, seven years of tears come. Like, God, you said, I'm not happy with you right now. With, you know, like, and the Bible is full of that. Like, this is all the journey of the people in the Bible. They, they found it tough to walk with God because, you know, like, you expect this amazing, I mean, God reigns and everything, and it's all wonderful in worship. But all the apostles died except one. They were all martyred for their faith. And then you read the catalog of Paul, what he experienced, the anointed Paul. Like, they've seen heaven with his own eyes, but shipwrecked and beaten up and whipped and rejected by everyone, living in constant danger, and until he got finally killed. Like, Try and live that in faith, in the goodness of God. And actually, what's at the heart of it, the crisis of faith, what is always at the heart of it? Is God good? And right now I'm, I'm reading a guy, he's called Richard Wormbrand. You know, like, so he was a Roman, uh, a Romanian pastor, and he got tortured by the communists, and like, you know, he says, there is no answer to the question why. Like, you get tortured and, like, uh, unbelievable what they experience, but they hang on to faith in a good God, in a certain future with God. Like, I'm reading it because I'm trying to get my head around, like, what is it like to live a Christian life under those conditions? Like, and persecution may start like... Um, you know, if you're a Christian, you can't do this. If you're a Christian, you cannot be a teacher in a public school. If you are a Christian, you cannot go to university. That's, that was a big one for them. You know, all these things. And, and then you go, God, is that, is that good? Is that your favor on my life? Is, is that what it looks like to be a child of God? So the testing of faith comes. Who does the testing of faith? Who is actually interested in destroying your faith? Satan. Satan, yes. So that's an easy one. So he has a go at our faith and he tries his utmost. Um, even in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Like, did God really say? And God is actually not good to you. He knew if you just take from the forbidden fruit, you will be like him. And he, he doesn't want to be that good to you. So, yeah, we know Satan is making things tough. But who else is really keen to test our faith? Yeah. 
He is. Do you, do you have a scripture passage to back it up? Yes. Yes. First Peter. Sorry. Yeah, the potter's. Yeah, there are many passages that say God is actually doing the testing. Even Jesus was uh, tested in the desert, and the Bible says he was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by Satan. But you know, the Holy Spirit was initiating it. Um, it, the uh, people of Israel were 40 years in the wilderness by the design of God where he would test them continually to reveal what's in their heart. So why would, why would God be interested in testing your faith? See what's in our heart? Yes. So that we know what's in our heart. Well, the testing of faith builds resilience. Like, you know, some Christians, they've just been cruising in life. Everything went just super perfect. The job, the family, everything. And then one little hiccup comes, one little, you know, major, and they lose their faith completely. They've never le learned to persevere in adverse circumstances. And so, especially when God wants revival and he wants us to be in the foreground of spiritual warfare and take ground for him in a hostile territory where people are absolutely anti-God, where Satan reigns, we need resilience. Because in, in the warfare, there are some losses, some hurts and pains. And so we need resilience for that. And then there's another reason. It builds a deeper relationship. Sorry? It builds a deeper relationship. Yeah, because like um, when your faith gets refined, all the selfish ambition, all the other stuff falls off. It's actually no longer about us. It's about God and hanging on to his promises. Um, so it builds resilience. It builds relationship. And there's another one. Yeah, character and perseverance. Yes, so that's all about us. What's the value of God that he gets out of faith in... Sorry? He brings him glory. It, and like, and I go, ooh, like I could have done better. <laughs> like I give you a quote, and this is, this is very traditional. The very, the very highest worship of God is this, that we ascribe to him truthfulness, righteousness, and whatever else should be ascribed to one who is trusted. What greater rebellion against God, what greater wickedness, what greater what contempt of God is there than not believing his promise? For what is this but to make God a liar or doubt that he is truthful? We can't really God give much. You know, like we haven't got money that we can give him or anything. And you know, all, all the good things that we achieve for him, he can achieve without us. But faith delights him. When all circumstances are against it and we are in pain and we don't see our way out and we still say, I trust in you, Lord. You alone are good. That's the highest form of worship that we can muster. I have... I finish with uh, good news. So I, I just um, I went just went like this and I thought, oh, I could have done better over the years. Like have stronger faith and be of good courage all the time. But then we get discouraged and you know uh, all of that. And we can be a little bit tough on ourselves. But interestingly, the Bible is not as tough on us as we are with ourselves. Because um, in the Bible says, this is about Abraham. And um, in hope, he believed against hope. This is in Romans 4. That he would become the father of many nations. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. No unbelief, made him waver concerning the promise of God. 
Is that true? No, like, it is true because if God says this is true and this is how I think about my son, it is true. But we know from the Bible, from the record, that Abraham struggled with his faith. And then when finally, you know, one year before the fulfillment of the birth of his son, the prophetic word came again. He laughed. He was over it. He was, he was laughing in unbelief. It was funny to him. You know, I'm 100 years old now. This is ridiculous. And God said he did not waver in his faith. Is that a bit encouraging? Like, it, it, it is, faith is a difficult journey to hang on there, hang in there. Yeah, like faith is a mustard seed. He's just delighted in the faith. You know, he's delighted that we're here this morning and worshipping him no matter what happens right now in our lives. So I stop here. Um, I want all of us to have saving faith. I want all of us to believe personally in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and receive the influx of the Holy Spirit and the divine life and power in us. And anyone that's been, you know, had that maybe and then you've been backsliding out of it and now it's just an intellectual thinking but you're no longer living it and trusting Jesus, this morning is a time to actually return and come back to Jesus. And... You, you may be sitting here in church and you know it's true and you've always been and you know since birth you went to church but you've never really made that step where you looked to Jesus and said, Jesus, I believe you for myself and I put my trust in you and I want to live with you and for you and spend eternity with you. Like this morning is a, an opportunity to take that step do it for yourself, not because you're in a context where, you know, every, that's just what it's done. And uh, I remember a testimony from the tent. Um, Lee Taberna is heading the ministry. He said, you know, they had all these experiences of God and then they came to faith. And he had one brother that went to all the meetings where the Holy Spirit went crazy and did all sorts of things, and he was never touched. He never felt anything. He never fell down. He never had anything happen to him. And so usually it's you know, like God gives you a demonstration of his power and encourages you to take faith. But with him, it wasn't that way. He had to take that step of faith first, and then he received so uh, I want to maybe, because we get a bit excited about the Holy Spirit in this place, but I want to put it to you, don't insist on something before you become a Christian. Like Jesus performed signs and wonders, miracles everywhere, but when the people came to him again and said, we want a sign, he said, an unbelieving and wicked generation asked for a sign. Because in Jesus' opinion at the time, he thought he gave enough evidence of God's power to take that step of faith. So this, this morning, can I encourage everyone that is here, you've heard enough, you've seen enough, it is time to take that step and meet Jesus for yourself. Amen. So I think the way we're doing it is, I ask the prayer team to come forward. Like, I want a few, please come. And Connor, you're coming as well. Always ready. And Caroline, you're coming as well. Yeah. So we just spread out here, just here. And so right now, I want to give an altar call for you to be, have saving faith, to believe in Jesus. So if, if that still needs to be sorted in your life, come out now. But in order not to make you stand out and look too conspicuous, this is a, a free altar call for anything that we need, including healing, any other support, 
so you're not going to stand out as the only one coming forward. But I want to give you that opportunity now. If Jesus talks to you now and calls you into a relationship with him now, respond now. Don't wait. And with that, maybe, um, Mark, are you playing the guitar? And Lord, I pray right now. Jesus, I pray that it's going to be so clear to us that your spirit is calling us into a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray for everyone here that's been away from you, that's been backsliding, that's slipped out of a relationship with you to return this morning. And Lord, I pray for everyone that's never really made that step, that knows things about you, and it's not even anti-faith, but just hasn't taken that step. Lord, this morning is the time, it's the day of salvation. Lord, I pray that your spirit is just working right now, just calling people into a relationship with you. Lord, as a whole church, that's what we want to see. We want to love people into the kingdom of God. And Lord, I pray that this morning will be a time of salvation. Lord, we pray that in your name. Just move right now. And, and then, Lord, I pray a blessing on all the other prayers as well. Prayers for healing, prayers for comfort, interceding for others, support for one another, Lord, in prayer. Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, please come. They're all available to you. Please come.